Hello, everyone, and welcome to Resurrection Lutheran Church on this Palm and Passion Sunday. May our worship today be glorifying to God and a blessing to you. Amen. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Mercifully assist us, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life everlasting, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Palm Sunday Gospel, according to St. Mark, the 11th chapter. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away, and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before, and those who followed, were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest! We confess together. On this Palm Sunday, we confess that we have not praised the Savior with our palms or our hearts. We have lived too selfishly, praising our own deeds. We have used our palms and lips to hurt our neighbor. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus. 
Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. May these palm branches remind us that Jesus came to Jerusalem to save. Save now. Hosanna in the highest. The Passion Sunday Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 27th chapter. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd, any one prisoner whom they wanted, and they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, or rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, and put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him 
also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, and about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, leme sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our texts for this Palm and Passion Sunday come from the Gospel lessons as just read. This Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week, during which we remember the most important week in human history, the true journey of Christ our King and the events of his Passion, including Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and finally Easter Sunday. In our Gospel readings, we saw two very different treatments of Jesus. In our Palm Sunday text, we witnessed Jesus' triumphant entrance into Jerusalem as the joyfully received Messiah King. But in our Passion Sunday Gospel, we witnessed Jesus' horrific exit from Jerusalem as the abused and rejected King of the Jews. Essentially, we saw Jesus, our Almighty Savior, fall from the heights of praise to the depths of hell in just a few days. Now that's a descent of royal proportions. In this morning's sermon, we will focus on Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace and King of Kings. First, we'll consider his royal descent. Second, we'll reflect on the reason he did this, his dissident citizens. And third, we'll consider the merciful victory of his crowning achievement. Now, as we read in our lesson from Mark chapter 11, when Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he was met with praise and adoration. Christ rightly received a royal welcome, an entrance fit for a king, and this was the peak of his popularity during Holy Week. His most loyal subjects faithfully obeyed his request by retrieving a colt for him, and joyfully served him by laying their own coats on it, making a makeshift saddle on which their leader could sit. Likewise, the people prepared the way for their long-awaited king in a noble and beautiful fashion. Many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. These people were essentially shouting, Save us, your highness. Deliver us, your majesty. Their words were a plea to their king, to bring them peace and security, salvation, and victory over their enemies. But their celebration didn't last long. Even as Jesus entered the city bearing the palm, he knew he'd soon be leaving to bear the cross. He was fully aware that his second parade through those streets wouldn't be so regal, that in order to, once and literally for all, fulfill God's righteous law and deliver his divided kingdom from evil, he would have to go to war for his people and furthermore fight to the death. Physically, this meant the gruesome torture and execution of a criminal in the flesh, but spiritually, it meant something far worse, the only reasonable punishment for treason, the worst fate one can face reserved for unfaithful servants, rebels of heaven, and dissident citizens who oppose God's kingdom banishment, hell, paying the damning wage, suffering the crushing weight of this wicked world, 
in being forsaken by all that is wise, kind, beautiful, and lovely, pure, righteous, holy, and loving, to be cast outside the city gates and abandoned by all, including God. Sure enough, just a few days later, his kingship suffered public scrutiny, and his popularity was quickly sinking. Jesus was betrayed and sold out by one of his loyal subjects. After the king's arrest, he was then abandoned and denied by the rest of his dearest friends, questioned and tried by men of lesser rank, and unjustly faced false charges of blasphemy. The envious Pharisees fanned the flames of dissidents. They roused the rabble to rebel against him, and the full courtyard pressed for his condemnation. The savior of the world was bound in shackles. They hurled hurtful words and irreverent gestures, rattling his chains and cackling like jesters. But the gravity of this situation was nothing to take lightly. There was nothing funny about what he was doing for them. It was dead serious. The king was dying to save his nation. And he had the great weight of the sins of every earthly citizen in the palms of his hands. The whole city now gathered, not for him, but against him. The same lively crowd that once welcomed him now rejected their holy king and viciously mocked him. He was taunted by those he taught, cursed by those he'd cured, and hurt by those he'd healed. Though he cast out many demons in their midst, they spurned his name as evil. Though he raised Lazarus from the dead, they demanded his death like a lowly criminal. The crowd shouted for blood, and they got what they wanted. Let him be crucified, they cried over and over. And finally, Pilate satisfied their traitorous desire. They betrayed their merciful king and traded their savior for a notorious prisoner, a brutal robber, murderer, and insurrectionist. The mob bombarded him with an explosion of anger. The king they once adored was adorned with a crown of thorns and now bore a scarlet robe of scorn. His royal title as the king of the Jews was used in vain, not for praise, but to shame. And those to whom he came in the name of the Lord to lead and to save, all turned away. As they struck him harshly with the hard dead reeds, he longed for the gentle memory of the hopeful crowd waving emerald green palm leaves upon his entry. But each short, sharp stroke shocked him back to reality. The agony was electrifying. Their whips felt like lightning, every lash striking with a red-hot flash of blinding pain stripping him of his armor, every last shred of honor, rendering the almighty leader tender, raw from torture, and weak from war. The king of kings was knocked to his knees, and they tore the prince of peace to pieces. Yet his rod and staff brought him no comforting. But unsteady as he was, dizzy from pain and barely standing, he remained unwavering. Though blinded by drops of sweat and tears of blood, he never lost sight of the victory before him. Finally, the king was paraded through the streets once again, and his dissident citizens led their leader to death. As he was nailed to the tree, many doubted his power and openly repudiated the king's authority. They denied his ability to save himself, or any of them for that matter, but they were truly mistaken. Clearly they were blind to the might of his hand and the power at work before them, to them who had delivered the king to death out of envy. Power and authority were simply tools best used to serve oneself. They thought all glory, laud, and honor was simply leverage to ascend the royal ladder to fame and gain personal wealth. But what they didn't understand was that this king came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. They didn't see that staying on the cross was much harder than coming down from it. They didn't realize that saving himself would have been easier than saving us. They didn't recognize that this king was mighty in compassion and rich in mercy, that this warrior was arrested willingly. His suffering was voluntary. His life was taken by nobody. It was laid down as an offering. Finally, his royal descent was nearing completion. He was surrounded by his enemies, and death was circling. Alas, with a mighty cry, the king died and yielded up his spirit. The ruler had fallen, but his kingdom was still standing. Which brings us to our second point, 
The reason the king died was because of his dissident citizens. Now the brutal truth is that we, just like the Pharisees, are prone to envy. And just like everybody's shouting, let him be crucified, we also are easily swayed by temptation to betray or deny our king. All too often, we're willing to do away with our Savior in exchange for popularity, earthly pleasure, or the treasure of our own sinful desires. But to trade our Savior makes us traitors. In the flesh, we selfishly desire the scepter. We both deliberately and unknowingly attempt to usurp God's authority because our sinful nature is prideful, egotistical, and foolishly hungry for power. Thus every day, we find ourselves longing for control and a crown of our own to overthrow the throne and declare ourselves the master of our lives. However, there's no glory in this. Undermining and overruling our Lord doesn't make us more powerful. It's our greatest weakness, and it ends in disaster, for our desire is a crumbling castle. The great deceiver rallies us to give in to this sinful dissidence and rebellious desire, but it's an impossible premise, because we're neither almighty nor autonomous. We're servants. In either way, we're swearing allegiance to another, whether it's to the king of kings or to the prince of the power of the air. We're serving someone, either as slaves to sin or servants of God. When we follow our own lead, this makes Christ, the king, our enemy. And if that's the case, then the reverse is the same, and we're actually acting as an enemy of our Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Essentially, this is spiritual insurrection, which just so happens to be the crime Barabbas was guilty of committing. Surely in sin, we are dissident citizens. On the cross, Jesus prayed for his enemies, saying, Father, forgive them, and were them. Your sins and mine are the reason God's Son was crucified. In his royal descent, Christ the King went to war with all of our anger, adultery, bitterness, blasphemy, coveting, drunkenness, violence, doubting, envy, enmity, foolishness, greed, gossiping, hatred, hypocrisy, idolatry, lying, lusting, murdering, malice, mockery, selfishness, pride, stealing, laziness, ungratefulness, apathy, and slander. It was our sins that held him there, not because our sins were more powerful than him, but because he was the only one, pure and powerful enough, to forgive them, forgive us. Thankfully, when we reflect on our sin, and ponder the word of our King, we realize the real enemy we're facing is our sinful disobedience. Therefore, we must repent and return to his merciful reign that we may live under his authority and remain in his grace. Though these days it's rarely implemented, a common punishment in the past for treason was death by hanging. So it stands to reason that the consequence of spiritual treason and insurrection against Jesus and the kingdom of God would be the same However, Christ the King took our place. He was hung upon the cross to absolve all us dissident citizens of our crimes against God and heaven, which finally brings us to his crowning achievement. Certainly, when Jesus died, his royal descent was complete, but by no means did it end in defeat. It was the greatest victory in history. As declared in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Death is swallowed up in victory. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, after Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, he descended into hell to make a triumphant decree and proclaim his glorious victory over sin, death, and the devil's vanquished evil empire. Furthermore, we also know that the grave was nowhere near strong enough to hold our king, that on the third day he rose again from the dead and eventually ascended to sit on his throne in heaven, meaning the redeeming descent of Jesus was actually his crowning achievement. Through it, our king has won salvation, exalted a nation, and delivered repentant sinners to the kingdom through the treasure of his royal forgiveness. 
as it says in Colossians, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The reason the Son of God descended from heaven and entered human flesh was to rescue us from damnation that we may not perish in the flesh, but serve him joyfully as forgiven citizens. And so, Jesus left this world in the same way he entered it, through an unpleasant yet life-giving labor of love, a painful, bloody crowning, followed by a loud mortal cry, humble, weak, and naked, simply put, in the flesh and fully man. For only in this way could Jesus redeem our sinful flesh, that the royal citizenship of heaven may be extended to all who believe in his victory, humbly bow down in repentant adoration, and acknowledge the crucified and risen Christ as ruler and king. Through faith in Jesus, we have been promised that one day we shall have a righteous crown of our own, one not earned by our perfect obedience, nor obtained by sinful insurrection, but freely bestowed by Christ our King in the forgiveness of his crucifixion and resurrection from the grave. Therefore, as we witness Jesus' royal descent during the rest of this Holy Week, we can also see the victory of his crowning achievement, and we have reason to celebrate, because Jesus Christ, the ruler of kings on earth, has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom. In conclusion, because of our king's royal descent, indecent, rebellious peasants like us can repent of our sinful dissidents and share in the victory of his crowning achievement. All who believe in him are not cast from his castle, but have a room prepared for them in his palace, and someday shall be with him in paradise. So Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among all who believe in Jesus and receive his decree of mercy. By his grace, we have been welcomed to enter the kingdom of God and forever praise him as citizens of heaven. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. We now join in confessing our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you have not already done so this week, I would like to encourage you to reflect upon your tithes and offerings to the Lord. If you would like to mail in your tithes or offerings, you may do so to the mailing address that is on the screen. If you would like to give your tithes or offerings online, you may do so on our website. Simply go to the website rlc.life and click the Give Online button. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.